Business and human rights is still an emerging field of research and practice. Some trace its emergence back to the 1976 OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and to the 1977 ILO tripartite declaration of principles concerning multinational enterprises and social policy. Only in 2000, however, did it finally enter a stage of accelerated development with the launch of the UN Global Compact, a voluntary initiative that brought together private corporations and civil society organizations with the purpose of spreading, among the former, the founding principles of the United Nations. While well, reports of human rights violations uh, uh, by and in private enterprises uh, have been piling up, in 2003 the UN Commission on Human Rights published a draft norms uh, on the responsibilities of transnational corporations with regards uh, to human rights. This, however, never made it into a treaty. The lack of clarity about the direct responsibility of private corporations in human rights uh, protection, uh, the inadequate uh, differentiation of the roles enterprises and states are supposed to play in relation to it, and their language. Uh, which um, was markedly uh, distinct uh, from that of the private sector, uh, were uh, some of the reasons uh, why the draft norms uh, never appealed uh, to the international business community and eventually failed uh, to draw enough support uh, to establish themselves uh, as the new international uh, normative standard uh, in the field. To push the agenda on business and human rights uh, uh, out of the statement, the UN Secretary General appointed in 2005 John Raggi as a special representative uh, on, uh, for human rights and uh, transnational corporations. During the past five years, uh, Raggi has uh, contributed uh, to crystallize a new normative framework based on the principles of uh, protection, respect and remedy, under which private enterprises are required uh, to operationalize uh, the respect for human rights by engaging in systematic exercises of human rights uh, risk and impact assessment. Over the years, this framework has earned increasing support around the world by private enterprises, civil society organizations and government authorities. Bragi draws on Amartya Sen to suggest that the success of a regime on business and human rights depends on the extent that it manages to motivate, activate and benefit from all the moral, social and economic rationals that can affect the behavior of corporations. This, he continues, call for incentives and punishments, uh, for systematic identification of opportunities and risks, and uh, for the mobilization of social movements and political coalitions that can bring all relevant uh, sectors of society on board. This broader political perspective on uh, regime formation takes a decisive step beyond uh, the strictly legalistic approach that had instead characterized the institutional process leading to the publication of the draft norms. And uh, this is possibly one fundamental reason why Raggi has been successful in the draft norms that have failed instead. As Raggi's initiative enters a new crucial stage of institutional development, that of institutional diffusion, it is important to ask two questions. First, whether the theoretical framework that underpinned this mandate is encompassing enough to address some of the problems that are bound to pop up uh, during this new phase. And second, whether it offers sufficient guidance to all stakeholders as to how to go about solving those problems. Here I will introduce one endemic problem and show in what way Raggi's theoretical framework can be extended in order to cover it. Civil society organizations, says Raggi, may name and shame those corporations that fail to respect human rights, and corporations can respond by knowing and showing. More concretely, they can equip themselves to understand the risk and the impacts of their operations on human rights, and they can show their audiences uh, how they have gone about managing risks, reducing impacts, and remedying possible violations. By adjusting their internal structures and procedures, and uh, by introducing uh, new scripts uh, that are consistent uh, with uh, the respect for human rights, right, it seems to suggest, corporations will be able to show that they are committed to human rights and will be able to gain a greater acceptance on the part of society. This conclusion, however, is uh, problematic. Acceptance uh, follows from recognition, but recognition does not automatically follow from uh, showing such adjustments. To see why, let us introduce uh, two examples. A man walks past a beggar who is asking for money on the street. Uh, the man stops, walks back, leans on the beggar, looks at him straight in the eyes, gives him a dollar, and warmly utters, good luck. As an audience, we will think that the man reveals compassion and solidarity. Now, suppose instead the man throws the dollar at the beggar and laughs as he says, good luck. 
as an audience, so we will think that the, the man's purpose was to humiliate the beggar. Now, let's take two different, uh, two different appearances uh, uh, on TV by Tony Hayward, BPCO, in occasion of the recent BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. In the first one, he argues uh, the oil spill uh, would not produce any environmental disaster and that BP will carry out uh, all the necessary environmental impact assessment uh, to address uh, the problems that might follow from the spill. He also adds uh, that he understands uh, that people feel frustrated uh, about uh, the accident. As he says that, a smirk crosses his lips. As an audience, we are wondering whether he really means it. In another famous uh, one-minute advertisement uh, BP produced, uh, Tony Hayward uh, appears uh, on screen with a visibly sorry expression on his face. He looks uh, deeply affected uh, by the accident. His words, his voice his, and his expression uh, perfectly match the message of deeply felt preoccupation and of commitment uh, to repair the damage. No smirk or smile gets on screen uh, this time. Now, both cases have to do with a company that has been thoroughly applying the principles and mechanisms included under Rocky's framework. Only, in the latter case, the CEO projects genuine respect when in the former he does not so effectively. These examples are useful because uh, they introduced one dimension about respect. Raggi has not taken into consideration and neither have all analysts in the field. The question of authenticity. Respect for human rights, in other words, delivers legitimacy gains uh, to corporations only when it convinces their relevant uh, audiences, that is, uh, when it comes across as authentic. Now, it may very well happen that uh, uh, for some audiences, the fact that uh, a corporation adjusts its uh, structures and procedures might be enough uh, to trigger belief. For broad segments of civil society, however, that is not enough. The actual behavior of uh, the corporation towards its stakeholders must authentically project the respect for human rights, such so structural changes are supposed to cue. Now, taking into account the question of authenticity is all the more crucial as Raggi's uh, framework enters a new stage of institutional diffusion into uh, many more societies uh, and corporations around the world. At this point, it becomes crucial to warn them that the importing human rights policies, human rights risk and impact assessment tools and grievance mechanisms from countries and corporations that have already successfully proved uh, their respect for human rights uh, is per se not sufficient. Those corporations managed to be successful because they authentically projected the, the respect for human rights upon their relevant audiences. The relevant policy question then is how corporations may project authentic respect. Today, however, neither Raghi nor other analysts in the field have addressed uh, this point. I would add uh, that uh, the theoretical framework Raghi has tapped into for the purpose of guiding his uh, activities under the UN mandate does not offer any guidance in this respect. On such ground, it is necessary to complement it. Since authenticity is a culture matter, it is necessary to introduce into Raghi's subtle understanding of the field of business and human rights a much more, uh, a much thicker understanding of uh, culture and the theoretical framework that can offer adequate guidance as how culture plays out uh, along the process of institutional diffusion of Raki's uh, framework. In real life situations, uh, corporations uh, may seek to project upon their audiences an attitude of respect to human rights, and their audiences in turn may decide whether such attitude is genuine, uh, therefore worth believing. Now, authenticity uh, results from a coherent alignment of all the elements uh, that make up such an instance of social interaction between the corporation and its audiences. If we approach it as if uh, it were a piece of theatre, we would immediately be in a position to spot uh, its ingredients. There is obviously a script. This is uh, what the corporation actually says to convince its audiences that it uh, really respects human rights. There are actors on stage we enact the script. There is a set of background representations of the very idea of respect and of that of human rights that the corporation and its audiences may or may not share. There is obviously a stage on which the interaction between the parties takes place. There are objects on stage that are used by the corporation to convince its audiences. And finally, uh, the only interaction uh, is, uh, supposed to, is exposed uh, to subtle uh, um, workings of uh, social power. 
social and economic hierarchies, for example, may well influence uh, the way the corporation enacts its message of respect and the way uh, its audiences receive it. If, for example, a company seeks to project its uh, respect for human rights uh, upon its audiences by showing a compassionate attitude vis-à-vis -vis the victims of a human rights uh, violation, then it cannot use a set of actors whose uh, uh, behavior on stage contradicts the very idea of compassion, for example, through sarcastic gestures. Also, in a, the elegant space of an aseptic uh, executive boardroom at the highest floor of a skyscraper, might not be an adequate stage to project compassion. Rather, the very venue where the violation may have taken place, where thus blood and tears appear to mix, might be fitter uh, for the purpose. The fact that the authenticity results from the alignment of so many factors implies uh, that uh, it is uh, quite fragile and therefore quite contingent. In other words, even if a company uses the very same script to uh, express its respect for human rights, in one occasion it may well achieve authenticity and in another it may not, possibly because the staging or the actors, for example, did not adequately match the script. To guide corporations as how to show authentic respect for human rights before the audiences, it is uh, therefore necessary to address Ruggie's framework through dramaturgical lenses. This will make them aware of the importance of aligning their message with all the other elements that, that come along uh, with it. The actors, the staging, the background of collective representations of respect and, uh, of human rights, the means of symbolic production, social power and the audiences. If they succeed, then companies uh, will be able to achieve uh, authenticity and will gain uh, great acceptance among their audiences. This allows me to make uh, one further point. Ruckett's framework has so far indicated a whole set of structural and procedural adjustments vice presidents for corporate sustainability may introduce to allow their companies to discharge their responsibility to respect human rights. By adding a dramaturgical perspective on Ruckett's framework, we can show why the, such adjustments uh, yield greater social license, uh, license for their companies in some occasions, but not in others. Also, we are able to deliver a new set of tools Vice Presidents for Public Affairs can use to make sure their companies will authentically discharge their responsibility to respect human rights and reap all the legitimacy gains from it. The availability of a richer theoretical framework that brings the question of authenticity within our horizon of vision will also enable civil society organizations to analyze much more closely and that much more in depth the actions corporations will carry out to discharge the responsibility to respect human rights. Before concluding, let me clarify one point. The proposal to use a, a dramaturgical approach to corporate life does in no way imply that corporations are fake. For various decades, uh, sociologists have used uh, this analytical framework to make sense of all types of social interactions. The point here is not about being fake. The point is whether the participants to a social interaction manage to be convincing whether they can uh, get on the same page, or, as a social scientists would say, whether they manage to establish a common horizon or meaning. To conclude, I've started my intervention by suggesting that uh, Ruggie's broader understanding of uh, regime formation has been the reason for its success uh, in comparison to the draft norms. As the framework enters a new stage of institutional diffusion around the world, however, a new element needs to be factored in to allow for its uh, successful uh, implementation within uh, new settings. This is the question of authenticity. Only by bringing authenticity in will we be able to understand uh, why respect for human rights can actually result into greater social license uh, for a corporation in one case, but not in another. This is an issue of great policy relevance. If we cannot tell these two situations apart, and if we cannot uh, steer corporations in the right direction, the framework might uh, run into a credibility problem. We need to help corporations discharge their responsibility to respect human rights in an authentic manner. And we need to train civil society organizations to ask corporations to do so and to spot when they do not. To push into this direction, however, it is necessary to extend the theoretical framework that uh, underpinned uh, Ruggie's framework. We need to add a dramaturgical perspective to Ruggie's political understanding of regime formation.